Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 3704 in the name of Mary Gujo on the Good Food Nation uh, Bracket Scotland Bill. I would invite members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons now as soon as possible. I will place an R in the chat function and I call on Mary Gujo to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, for around 10 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scotland began its journey to becoming a good food nation in 2014 with the publication of our national food and drink policy. This document first set down this government's ambition to turn Scotland into a country where people from every walk of life take pride and pleasure in and benefit from the food that they produce, buy, cook, serve and eat each day. From 2015 until 2017, how to achieve that ambition was considered by a Scottish Food Commission made up of 16 members. Its interim and final reports helped to set out the steps leading to the Good Food Nation Bill. I want to thank them all, all of the people and organisations who responded to earlier government consultations and engagement, and particularly to my predecessors Richard Lockhead and Fergus Ewing for guiding this work and enabling us to reach today's milestone. In a Good Food Nation, everyone in Scotland has access to and the means to afford the healthy, nutritious food they need with dietary related diseases like heart disease and diabetes in decline. This vision sees the people of Scotland taking a keen interest in their food, knowing what constitutes good food, valuing it and seeking it out whenever they can. The environmental impact of food consumption is managed for the benefit of everyone in Scotland. Our vision sees food producers and companies continuing to be a thriving feature of the economy and as places where people want to work. Over the last seven years, we've moved from wanting to become a good food nation to being a good food nation through a range of activities relating to health, knowledge, the environment, the economy and social justice. Examples include supporting the rollout of the Soil Association's Food for Life programme. Yes. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful for the Minister to, uh, for, for taking the intervention. You just said that you've moved to being a good food nation. Uh, however, how, do you, how does that equate to the fact that Scotland is the second most obese country in the world after the USA and we're the unhealthiest nation in Europe? We haven't moved forward at all, really, Minister, have we? Cabinet Secretary. I would say that we certainly have moved forward, but in terms of the comments that I'll be setting out today, again, the Good Food Nation itself as a, as a framework bill really underpins the work that we're taking and the future work that we will undertake, because like a lot of other things, we know that there is still a long way to go and specific challenges that we need to get to grips with and to tackle. So I was referring prior to my intervention, uh, to that intervention in relation to some of the examples of the work that we've done in becoming a good food nation. And uh, in relation to that, we've supported the role of the Soil Association's Food for Life programme, which ensures that more local food finds its way onto school dinner plates, with children eating more healthy and nutritious food. We provide grants to people growing their own food in community gardens, providing a healthy source of food locally and a focus for community events and education and we continue to tackle the suffering that is caused by food insecurity. This financial year, we have provided around £2.5 billion to low-income households, including £56 million for free school meal alternatives during school holidays, £70 million in flexible local responses to food and financial insecurity, and over £100 million for the third sector. But we are working with the private sector too. The Scottish Government and the food industry work together through Scotland Food and Drink, a unique partnership that facilitates our working side by side. We have supported industry to reformulate high calorie foods and drinks in order to improve the nation's health, to create regional food ambassadors and to resource regional food groups and events. These and numerous other initiatives can be found in the latest update of our Good Food Nation programme of measures published on the Scottish Government's website. This programme will now be underpinned by the Good Food Nation Bill's measures, enabling us to build momentum as we improve people's lives through the food they grow, buy and eat. Now we are taking the next steps on the Good Food Nation journey with this bill. It will underpin the good work we're already doing in law and act as the foundation upon which we build our Good Food Nation. I want to thank the RAIN Committee members for their report and their work in gathering evidence on the bill at stage one. I'll cover some of their conclusions and recommendations in today's debate, but I will, of course, also provide a full response to that report before stage two. 
I also want to thank everyone who responded to the call for evidence. They did so passionately and with a wealth of knowledge of the food system. Yes. Rachel Hamilton. Presiding officer. Um, presiding officer, the committee um, expected a proper response to the report at stage one, and we were disappointed that we didn't get that. We kept our side of the bargain by um, keeping to the Scottish Government's timetable, but we just got a scant response, and I think that's disappointing. Cabinet Secretary. I hope the member would also appreciate, though, that it's only fair that I give that report and all the work that's gone into it full and due consideration, which is what I'm undertaking. And as I've just said in my response, I will be issuing that to the committee prior to stage two. Now, all of the views and ideas have been and are being considered carefully during this bill process. At the heart of the bill is the requirement on the Scottish Government and key public authorities to draft, consult on, publish and keep under review Good Food Nation plans. The scope of these is intended to be broad and ambitious. Through the National Good Food Nation Plan, Government will be obliged to set out clearly for the public the outcomes that we aim to achieve in food-related issues, the policies we intend to put in place and, critically, the metrics upon which our progress can be measured. Scottish Ministers will also be obliged to consider how the National Good Food Nation Plan relates to specific functions that they carry out, further enhancing our joined-up approach to food policy. The bill creates similar obligations on local authorities and health boards that will lead to greater coherence of food policy at national and local level. I want these Good Food Nation plans to really deliver for our nation's social and economic well-being, education, the environment, people's health and economic development. And for that reason, I completely agree with the RAIN Committee's view that consultation on our Good Food Nation plans must be as wide, inclusive and participatory as possible. It is only through involving others that we will achieve important changes to our food system and food culture, particularly those whose voices are too easy to ignore and who can benefit the most from change. Now, one of the key issues that had been raised and debated during Stage 1 concerned the right to food and how best to incorporate that into law. We are committed to doing this and set out in the cooperation agreement with the Scottish Greens not only that intention but also how we will do that. The Scottish Government intends to bring together a raft of rights under upcoming human rights legislation. And that legislation will incorporate into Scots law the right to an adequate standard of living, which includes the right to adequate food. And I'm pleased that the committee supports this approach. Now, a recurring theme in written and oral evidence was also the need for scrutiny throughout development of the Good Food Nation plans. I agree. I acknowledge the committee's call for a greater role for the Scottish Parliament in scrutinising the Good Food Nation plans in its Stage 1 report and its specific recommendations on how to achieve that. So I will consider how best to enhance relevant provisions as part of the next stages of the bill process. Another key issue was oversight, with some contributors calling for a standalone food commission to oversee the delivery of Good Food Nation plans. Now, as the committee itself recognises, views are mixed on the merits or otherwise of establishing a new statutory body what its duties might be and if new or existing organisations would, be uh, would be best placed to carry out any such work. As part of our shared policy programme with the Scottish Green Party, we committed to considering the need for a statutory body such as a Food Commission. This issue was widely de deliberated on during the Stage 1 process and I am carefully considering the Committee's conclusions and recommendations on oversight. Finally, I want, to the turn, I want to turn to the question of outcomes and targets. The Stage 1 process gathered a wide range of opinions and views from stakeholders. Some called for the inclusion of detailed targets on the face of the bill, others wanted to see more high-level objectives, while many also called for a statement of intent or some incorporation of the vision on the face of the bill. The Scottish Government has already set food and nutrition related targets such as reducing food waste by 33% by 2025 and aiming to halve childhood obesity by 2030. We have also taken action to reflect the need to meet such targets such as publishing guidance on healthy eating in schools to improve the nutritional quality of school food. Presiding officer, I agree with the committee when it does not recommend that targets be included on the face of the bill, but I note that not at this point. But I note that members concluded that the Scottish Government should consider how we might better reflect our high-level objectives in the Bill, and I will undertake to do that. Presiding Officer, I really look forward to this afternoon's debate and to hearing the different contributions from members, but I think if there is one thing in this chamber that we can all agree on, it is surely the importance of food in our lives, of having healthy, sustainably, locally produced food more available to all in Scotland, with people appreciating the role and significance of having good food and being a good food nation. 
I am therefore proud to move that the Parliament agrees to the general principles of the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cabinet Secretary. I can advise the Chamber we are quite tight for time, so uh, interventions will probably have to be accommodated into speaking uh, slots. And I call on Beatrice Wishart uh, on behalf of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Bill uh, for around nine minutes, uh, Ms Wishart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak to the Committee's Stage 1 report on the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill this afternoon, although perhaps not pleased that the reason I am speaking rather than the convener is due to his absence from Parliament, and we wish him well and a speedy recovery. I would like first to thank everyone involved in the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee's Stage 1 inquiry. The Committee was able to draw on a wealth of quality evidence to inform its conclusions and members were encouraged by the passion and expertise of those advocating for change in the food system. Before I discuss the substance of the Committee's report, I would like to first put on record my disappointment that a more detailed written response has not been provided by the Scottish Government to inform the debate today, and I look forward to receiving a detailed response to the Committee's recommendations prior to Stage 2. The Good Food Nation Scotland Bill is described by the Scottish Government as framework legislation. The Bill creates this framework by placing a duty on Scottish Ministers and certain relevant authorities, in this case local authorities and health boards, to produce Good, nation, good Food Nation plans. These plans are the primary vehicle for driving forward the objectives, indicators and policies the Scottish Government and these relevant authorities want to employ in pursuit of their ambition for Scotland to become a Good Food Nation. The Scottish Government has, since 2009, published a range of position papers setting out their ambitions for a good food nation, and the expectation on the part of many stakeholders was that the Good Food Nation Bill would consolidate these existing strands of policy and set out a clear vision for the Scottish food system. Around two-thirds of respondents to the Committee's call for views felt that the Bill should be clearer on its purpose and outcomes and many stakeholders raised serious concerns about what they saw as a lack of ambition for the legislation. The Scottish Human Rights Commission, for example, argued that, and I quote, it is disappointing that the bill is not framed in terms of the ambition to achieve a just transition to a fair, healthy and sustainable food system, and does not require that food plans set out the steps that will be taken to eradicate hunger and progressively realise the rights to food health, equality and a healthy environment. When the Committee raised the lack of ambition on the face of the Bill with the Cabinet Secretary, she said she was aware of these concerns, but emphasised that it was the plans themselves which would set out this ambition due to the framework nature of the legislation. While the Committee was reassured to some degree by these comments, we nonetheless conclude that, for the Bill to be effective, the Scottish Government should clearly articulate these wider ambitions in the plan when it is published for consultation and laid before this Parliament. In helping to drive this wider ambition, the Committee explored whether targets or more detailed outcomes should be included in the Bill. We took a lot of evidence from stakeholders. Many thought that targets or outcomes should be included on the face of the Bill, whilst many thought that targets or outcomes should not. This is a complex issue, not least because different people interpret and understand targets and outcomes to mean different things. Whilst we agree that it would not be helpful to include numerical targets on the face of the Bill, the Committee was more persuaded that the Bill would benefit from some high-level objectives to reflect the broad vision and ambitions for a good food nation. We urge the Scottish Government, therefore, to give further thought to how high-level objectives could be included in the Bill at Stage 2 and, in particular, whether Section 1.5 should be widened to include other policy outcomes. Oversight and accountability of the National Good Food Nation policy and plans was a central theme highlighted in evidence. As drafted, the Bill's oversight mechanism is the requirement to lay all national plans in the Scottish Parliament and to lay a progress report every five years. We took a lot of evidence which questioned whether these provisions were sufficient. There was broad agreement across the majority of responses to the Committee's call for views for the Bill to provide an oversight function beyond the reporting and review mechanisms included in the Bill at Sections 5 and 6. Accordingly, the Committee recommends the Bill be amended at Stage 2 to strengthen the oversight function. 
The committee heard a range of views about what this oversight function should look like and who should be tasked with it. We heard for this oversight function we heard support for this oversight function being incorporated into an existing body, as well as support for a new body to be established, with a range of suggestions as to what sort of body that should be. Committee members, agree, committee members agree that we are not in a position to make a clear recommendation on this. We note the Scottish Government's long-standing position that a new oversight body is not required, but that it is currently considering this under the terms of the Butte House Agreement. We ask the Scottish Government to update Parliament on its thinking in advance of the Stage 1 debate. We note with concern that this consideration is in its early stages and the committee would assume that any oversight role deemed necessary should be provided for through this bill. The committee also note the bill does not provide the Parliament with a formal role in approving these plans. We recommend, therefore, that the bill be amended at stage two to give Parliament a greater role, requiring it to give approval of the plans after they have been laid to ensure they align with stakeholder expectations and drive the kind of transformational change we want to see in the food system. A number of stakeholders argued that the bill should either incorporate or align with the right to food. This committee wanted to understand whether the bill was the appropriate legislative vehicle for such a right or, as the First Minister has already outlined under the Butte House Agreement, that a right to adequate food be incorporated into wider human rights legislation. The committee was persuaded that the proposed wider human rights legislation is the best means to provide for a right to food and that it would be unhelpful to have this right singled out and excluded from the proposed human rights legislation. On consultation, sections 2 and 8 of the Bill provides for a consultation on the draft Good Food Nation plans. The Committee recognises that if the National Plan is to be effective, then it must draw on the experiences of everyone using and working within the Scottish food system. We heard compelling evidence from organisations like the Food Train, Obesity Action Scotland and the Food Foundation about the need for a comprehensive and wide-ranging consultation exercise. The Committee firmly believes that consultation undertaken by Scottish Ministers on the draft National Good Food Nation Plan must be as wide, inclusive and participatory as possible. The Committee also agrees with the evidence it received that the consultation methods should used should be tailored for each specific audience and that one size will not fit all. We therefore welcome the commitments made by the Cabinet Secretary and our officials that the Scottish Government's approach to the consultation will be as open, accessible and inclusive as possible. As I have already mentioned, the Bill requires relevant authorities to publish a Good Food Nation plan. This places a similar requirement on relevant authorities to those placed on Scottish Ministers by Section 1 of the Bill, although there is no requirement for relevant authorities' reports to be laid in the Scottish Parliament. In evidence, it was clear while some local authorities embraced the Good Food Nation vision some time ago, other authorities will be at an earlier stage of the Good Food Nation journey. The Committee therefore considers it essential that these authorities have access to information and advice to support the development of their plans, and called on the Scottish Government to set out its response to this report, how, how it intends to provide this information and advice. Sections 4 and 10 of the Bill provide that Scottish Ministers and relevant authorities must have regard to their Good Food Nation plans when exercising specified functions. These functions are to be set out in subordinate legislation. The Committee believes that Sections 4 and 10 are key to the effectiveness of the plans. We agree it is regrettable that a draft list of all the specified functions was not available to inform parliamentary scrutiny, although we welcome the Cabinet Secretary's confirmation that this list will be included in the consultation on the draft national plan. The Committee honed in on one particular aspect of Section 4, which was the provision for the subordinate legislation setting out the specified functions to be considered by Parliament under the negative procedure. Officials told us that this was because the subordinate legislation would likely include a long list and did not meet the usual criteria for the affirmative procedure. The Committee agrees that the decision about which of the Scottish Minister's functions should be exercised with regard to the Good Food Nation plans should meet the criteria for the affirmative procedure and that the Parliament should have a stronger role in scrutinising these specified functions. Accordingly, we recommend that any regulations made under Section 4 are subject to the affirmative procedure. Mr. Question, you do need to bring your remarks to a close, please.
I have something to say about the financial uh, memorandum costs, um, but suffice to say that uh, the Good Food Nation Bill offers a real opportunity to transform Scotland's relationship to food. But if the plans are to drive this transformational culture change, then they must be robust with clear objectives, adequate resources and effective oversight and accountability mechanisms. National and localised plans also need to work together coherently and complement existing and future policy initiatives. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ms Wilshire. I now call on Rachel Hamilton um, to speak for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Here we have it. The SNP are finally introducing their promised Good Food Nation Bill six years late, promised in their 2016 and 2021 manifestos. We are here all very proud of what Scotland produces, exporting £6.3 billion worth of food and drink annually, but we need to do more to promote our produce at home. Tuning into Radio 4's food programme for their piece on the Good Food Nation Bill, it was highlighted why we are debating this legislation today. Scotland has been branded the sick man of Europe when it comes to our diet, with people regularly eating carolly calorie dense and nutrient deficient foodstuffs. We have 66% of adult population estimated to be obese and according to current trends by 2035 more than 480,000 people in Scotland will be living with diabetes. It's estimated around about 6.7% of men and 4.2% of women are living with chronic heart disease and we have to reverse these trends urgently. It's therefore important that the bill has a purpose clause setting out what the government's intentions are through the Act as a whole. The Scottish Food Coalition and others believe that we all have a right to food and it should be included in the bill. I'm yet to be convinced that the Cabinet Secretary has addressed this and it will be interesting how the Butte House Agreement uh, reflects uh, the intention through the forthcoming human rights legislation. We've heard from a range of stakeholders on the draft bill, and I want to thank them for their valuable input. Stakeholders have a great expectation of this bill, and therefore it is incumbent on me and my colleagues in the RAIN Committee to ensure that we get this right. The bill has been welcomed by many, but simply doesn't go far, some people say. We support the bill at stage one, and given the wealth of evidence and consideration of the RAIN Committee's report, substantial revisions are required to ensure the bill is fit for purpose. So first and foremost, there's an expectation that local authorities will need significant resource to deliver the Good Food Nation Plan. And it was noted that the financial memorandum, which Beatrice Wishart didn't get time to cover, lacks detail in relation to the costs that are likely to fall to re relevant authorities. And if lo local authorities are expected to uh, shoulder the weight of responsibility, the government must recognise that the support should extend to access to information and advice to support the development as, of the plans, as well as that financial resource. I want to touch on the points of importance which I feel are reflected in the RAIN Committee's report, namely that the bill should uh, consider high-level objectives, which in short are the link between the Scottish Government policy and the broad vision and ambitions for the Good Nation policy. I haven't got time to cover everything today, and I'm hoping that my colleagues and other colleagues in the RAIN Committee will cover those other aspects today. But first of all, uh, I want to talk about um, farmers and food producers who should be at the heart of Scottish procurement to support jobs, the environment, skills development and the social impacts that we see right across Scotland. Dave Mackay of the Soil Association made this connection between food and farming clear when he said, we want to see our government join the dots between the interconnected climate, nature and dietary health crisis. And we all know that local multipliers also show that money spent by local authorities will return that investment to the local economy and have wide ranging benefits and cost savings for local authorities. But there's still a disconnect between local producers and the food served in hospitals, in schools and in prisons. Locavore is a Scottish based company and it has made great um, strides in supplying lo locally with veg grown on three sites within 10 miles of Glasgow city centre. And that's a good example. In East Ayrshire, we heard in the committee from Mark Hunter, they have very good links with other food sectors in the local authority area. 
And if we can get a good food education programme in the schools, we can support the health agenda and obviously the economic development of our local community. Furthermore, there is an appreciation and an understanding that the whole food system from gate to plate and back is needed. We understand, although, that several public sector organisations who want to support local procurement find that the budget constrains them, which means this is simply not possible, and the government must address that. And I would like to see uh, more detail within the financial memorandum reflecting that. Food education, as I've said, is vital, and the committee noted in its Stage 1 report that there are several social factors impacting people's ability to source, purchase, cook and consume good food. And they range from transport infrastructure, income knowledge and the skills to prepare healthy meals. And it should be noted that a third of respondents to the consultation uh, mentioned education. We also heard from the acclaimed uh, Great British Menu chef, Gary McLean, who said that we are failing to educate the next generation about food and preparation. He said, it goes back to the fact those life skills have not been, get been getting passed down from parents to kids for three or four generations. And this is exactly why we need this bill to deliver on this matter. Yes? Tim Fairley. Does the member not recognise that poverty is as big a driver of food inequality as anything else? Rachel Hamilton. Well, I mean, of course it's a driver, but, um, you know, you responded to my Twitter, uh, Mr Fairley, my Twitter account, when I posted about education, and you said that you fully supported it. So I'm surprised that you're not actually um, stating that you're Through the chair, right please, Ms Hamilton. Sorry? Oh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, so, in the borders, you can cook in Peebles is offering classes and demonstrations, talks and workshops and food and health related issues all over Scotland. And they found that half of Scottish children from urban areas think oranges grow in Scotland and 70% think cotton comes from sheep. I've long championed food and countryside education and it's vital that we use this bill to educate people on the importance of good local food and how to reduce weight, waste. I will move on because time is short. But Presiding officer, there must be effective oversight of the Good Food Nation policy and accountability for the statutory Good Food Nation plan. Scottish Environment Link said in its response that the lack of an oversight function means that a vital piece of the jigsaw is missing and risks the effectiveness of this legislation in driving the changes that are urgently needed. The Scottish Conservatives agree, as does the committee, that the current oversight provisions in the bill that's the requirement to lay all national plans in the Scottish Parliament and to lay a progress report every five years are insufficient. So we will seek to address this at stage two with a view to strengthen the oversight function and allow Parliament to become a ca the accountable uh, body. Furthermore, many stakeholders, including Nourish Scotland and Obesity Action, agreed that there's a need for an oversight body. And I would ask the Cabinet Secretary for urgent clarity on whether the Scottish Government intend to designate one. In conclusion, presiding officer, we support the bill at stage one, but fundamentally believe that it is lacking in the provisions required. And I'll leave a quote from Mary, Professor Mary Brennan, who said, there is a great commitment to move the needle in the right direction, improving our health, social and economic outcomes, and playing our part in improving our, our environmental outcomes with careful management and collaboration co-creation between national and local levels and public bodies and with a clarity of purpose, purpose on the direction of travel delivery as possible. Thank you, presiding officer. We seek to strengthen the bill in stage two. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ms Hamilton. I now call on Colin Smith for around seven minutes, Mr Smith. Thank you, presiding officer, and thank you to the Rural Affairs Committee for the extensive evidence they gathered to inform their stage one report. Like the committee, Labour is happy to support the principles of the bill at stage one, but we do believe it needs to be significantly strengthened. Uh, but I want to begin by, by paying tribute to the work of the members of Scotland's Food Coalition, that the trade unions, the charities, the diverse alliance of civil society in Scotland who have come together to fight for food justice. They recognise that in a country with so much fine food and drink, with plenty of land, plenty of sea, plenty of talented producers, there is no reason why we should not have plenty of good food for everyone. But the reality is, too many people in Scotland are still going hungry or are reliant on food banks to eat. Far too many people are employed in jobs in the food and drink sector which are insecure and poorly paid. Too many agricultural practices continue to be incentivised by a government support system despite their negative impact on our climate and wildlife. Yet too many of our farmers and fishers cannot make a decent living. 
I'll take an intervention. Yeah. Tim Fairley. I, I simply don't understand your saying that the farming system that is uh, continuing to degrade our, our countryside when there are numerous schemes to help us protect the environment through the EU policies and the policies that the government are continuing with. Colin Smith. If Mr Fairley thinks the current scheme is, is, is so perfect, then I don't understand why the government have promised to bring forward legislation to change that scheme that is, frankly, failing to deliver. Um, but I, think, I think Mr Fairley wants to keep having a debate. I'm happy to have that, but I think there needs to be changes. So does his government. But, President officer, the members of the Food Coalition recognise that our food policies are not perfect, that we need to find a better, fairer way to feed ourselves that does not damage our people and does not damage our environment. Parliament has an opportunity to recognise this as well, but only if we get this bill right. I recognise that we have come a long way, somewhat slowly, since the publication in 2014 of the National Food and Drink Policy. I recall when I was first elected being told by ministers that we did not really need legislation to become a good food nation, and I have had motion after motion calling for the right to food to be enshrined in law, voted down time and time again. But, but thanks to the tenacity and unity of purpose from members of the Food Coalition and many others, we now have a bill, and we now have at least the promise of the right to food. However, it is clear that the bill does not go far enough. What should be a historic opportunity to transform Scotland's food system to reduce food insecurity by ensuring everyone has access to healthy, sustainable food is in danger of being a missed opportunity. It is the political equivalent of standing in front of an open goal, then belting the ball over the bar from six yards. The government says it is a framework bill, but, presiding officer, it is an empty frame without a vision. Labour is clear that vision, the purpose of this bill, should ultimately be to enable the right to food, and it should say that. As the UN Special Rapporteur, Professor Michael Fackley said, or told the committee when given evidence on the 28th of Feb February, if the Good Food Bill is strengthened and infused with human rights commitments, Scotland will stand out as one of the leading nations that seek to promote and realise the right to food for its people. It is a view shared by the overwhelming majority who gave evidence to the committee. In their written submission, the Health and Social Care Alliance said it was, and I quote, disappointed that the bill did not take this opportunity to embed the right to food into Scots law. And while they acknowledge the government have said they want to embed that right within wider human rights legislation, they went on to say that is no reason not to start now and indicate how seriously Scotland takes both the right to food and human rights. So, Scottish Labour believes the bill should be unambiguous in its purpose to ultimately enable the right to food, but we will work with the government on how best to achieve that. We support the widespread calls to amend the bill in five key areas to define the purpose of the bill, to have clear, measurable objectives, to establish an independent food commission, to strengthen the parliamentary scrutiny process, and to ensure that ministers have a duty to act in accordance with a national good food national plan, not simply have regard to it. I hope the government will work with all parties to enable those amendments, because I believe we can show unity behind a strong bill. Now, one of the challenges we do have, presiding officer, is the fact that the government have not published a response to the committee's stage one report, so we are not clear yet what amendments the government will bring forward between the very short time of stage one to stage two. But if the government do not bring forward amendments in those five areas, Labour will. So, taking each of those areas in turn, we believe, as do the overwhelming majority of respondents to the committee, the bill should have a purpose clause, and that should include giving practical effect to the right to food. As WWF said in their written submission, the bill should establish high-level principles and objectives for Scotland's food system, providing the overarching framework for what a good food nation means in practice. It is encouraging that the committee has urged the Scottish Government to include high-level objectives at stage to, but we do believe they should go further, and not only should they be on the face of the bill, but they should be measurable. In evidence to the committee on the 26th of January, the Trussell Trust highlighted that child poverty tar targets had been on the face of the Child Poverty Scotland Act 2017, and this focused the sector on a unified goal and maintained momentum. And, President Officer, does anybody seriously think the Climate Change Act should not have had a measurable commitment to net zero by 2045? Why should we not show the same ambition and clear legally binding targets when it comes to tackling food poverty or tackling childhood obesity? The Bill needs to, to set a clear direction also for future policy. As Voluntary Health Scotland said in their written submission the Bill should establish high-level policy principles and objectives for fixing Scotland's food system, and that this should, in a quote, 
inform and underpin all future food-related legislation and policy, including, but not limited to, the Agriculture Bill, the Circular Economy Bill, the Environment Bill, and future public health measures on food. It was an important point also made by RSPB, and one kind who rightly highlighted that animal welfare should be prioritised in this bill and future policy. Signed off, sir, Labour also shares the view that the bill should provide a more comprehensive oversight function. As Scottish Environment, Environment Link argued in their written submission, the lack of an oversight function means that a vital piece of the jigsaw is missing. We support the call from the Scottish Food Coalition for an independent Scottish Food Commission who highlighted the example in their evidence to the committee on the 19th of January of the Scottish Land Commission. The view that the role should be undertaken by a new body was also backed by the Scottish Human Rights Commission and its written evidence when they made the valid point that allocating the role to an existing body and a quote is likely to underestimate the scale of the work involved and the specialisms required to deliver it. And the way in which the bill is scrutinised by Parliament also needs to be clear. We believe the National Good Food Nation Plan should ultimately require the approval of Parliament. Finally, President Officer, we share the view that the well-worn legislative phrase requiring the Minister to have regard for their own National Good Food Nation Plan should be replaced with to act in accordance. Pregnant officer inclusion, for far too long, too many people in Scotland have lacked adequate access to food, exposing the gross inadequacies and inequalities that we face today. In a nation that provides so much outstanding food and drink, it really is to our nation's shame that many children in Scotland still go to bed you hungry. You need to conclude now, Mr Smith. Th thank you, President Officer. We do have a long way to go to make sure this bill is a bold Good Food Nations bill, but we support the principles of the bill and we will work with the government and all parties to deliver the changes thank that are thank needed. Thank you very much. We now move to the open debate. I call Jenny Minto to be followed by Maurice Golden for up to six minutes, please, Ms Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Good Food Nation bill is the first piece of legislation I have been involved in and I would like to thank the committee clerks and my fellow committee members for all our hard work and dedication to this vitally important issue. We took evidence from organisations from Shetland to Argyll and Butte, from Zero Waste Scotland to the Scottish Food Coalition, evidence to support a bill which will take Scotland further along the road to becoming a good food nation by creating a national plan and requiring plans to be created by public bodies. As Jane Jones of Argyll and Butte Council said, we are already on that journey, we are not at the very beginning of it. We need to recognise the progress that we have already made, but the Good Food Nation agenda gives us the opportunity to do more. Food and cuisine are important to me. My culinary journey has been a bit of a winding road, turning down good Scottish puddings covered in custard at school to looking forward to them when at a freezing filming location. Only eating haddock smothered in ketchup as a child to enjoy fish of every variety as my top food choice. So personally, I am pleased that the Scottish Government has the vision of Scotland as a good food nation, where it is normal for Scots to love their food and know what constitutes good food. We took evidence from Robin Gourley, who helped develop Recipe for Success when he was at East Ayrshire. He said, if you look at the work of Scotland Food and Drink, other industry bodies, our colleagues working in health and those working in climate, you see that there is a consensus to do something better with food. Also, that those who serve and sell food, from schools to hospitals, retailers to restaurants, serve and sell the best. One of my own staff recalls with pleasure the lunches he and his friends enjoyed when, at Dunoon, when Dunoon Grammar School upped its game and began to find, provide food that was both nutritious and delicious. He also reflects on how these meals were especially important to youngsters from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the Scottish Government invested £5 million in food education projects from 2010 to 2017. So here we see public policy actually improving the lives and health of vulnerable individuals, which is the next part of the vision of for Scotland as a good food nation, that everyone in Scotland has easy access to the healthy and nutritious food they need. Food doesn't just feed the body, it enriches our lives in other ways. It is a way of bringing people together, from burn suppers to the food served at the Sikh Gurdwaras. For all too many children, home cooking is a ready meal served in front of the television. But serving, I, I won't actually, Rachel, Miss, Miss Hamilton. But serving attractive food in schools and other institutions will allow us to offer many more people the opportunity of eating together, of sharing food together, united by the joy of good food. By creating Good Food Nation plans, the connection between food and health will help reduce dietary-related diseases, 
but also support people with long-term conditions. Two weeks ago, I visited the recently opened dialysis unit in Rothsey, Isle of Bute. I met a patient who receives dialysis three times a week. Until this unit opened, he had to travel to Inverclyde. He told me the difference of having his dialysis close to home. He had time to prepare his evening meal, ready for when he returned from his treatment, instead of a microwave meal. The food he was eating was healthier, and he was happier. In our evidence, we got some stark figures from Ian Galland of Zero Waste Scotland about the environmental impact of food. An area larger than China is used to grow food that is never eaten. One billion hungry people in the world could be fed on less than a quarter of the food that is wasted in the UK, the US and Europe. And in hospitality and food services here in Scotland, the equivalent of 106 million meals are discarded every year. That is one out of every six meals. Ian Gland concluded by saying that Scottish households need support to end food waste and to recycle as much as possible. Wasting food is wasting water, energy and resources. The Good Food Nation Bill should be an enabler for this support. And finally, Scottish producers ensure what they produce is increasingly healthy and environmentally sound. And Professor Mary Brennan of the Scottish Food Coalition said, a good food nation produces food that does as little harm as possible to the environment. It produces and consumes food that is produced to the highest welfare and well-being standards. It looks after its natural resources, the animals, fish, watercourses and marine environments that are central to our existence. So shopping for tempting food can and should be an enjoyable exercise, but it becomes a misery if most of what you can see is too expensive and you and your loved ones must do without. And while minimum wage levels, the cost of heating homes and an increase in national insurance are subjects for different debates, today we can continue putting Scotland on a course that will make school meals, hospital meals and all food served by public bodies support the health and well-being of our nation. Serving the right food can also improve our communities and environment. Sourcing local in in ingredients sustainably supports local communities, cuts food miles and helps us on the road to net zero carbon emissions. And in this complex and turbulent time in world history, increasing food self-sufficiency makes strategic sense too. But to do this, we need to support Scottish producers in ways that enable them to provide quality ingredients at prices people can afford and what producers we have. In my own constituency, Argyll and Butte, SMEs who are coffee roasters, tea growers, dairy, beef and lamb farmers, ice cream producers, vegan cheese makers and fish and shellfish fishers. And not forgetting folk with gardens and allotments growing their own fruit and veg. Presiding officer, I will finish with a quote from Professor Michael Fakri, UN Special Rap Rapporteur on the right to food, who provided a video statement to the committee. COVID-19 has laid bare the inequalities and underlying issues in every country's food system. In this context, your Good Food Nations Bill is a timely and exemplary response to address deep-rooted challenges. I support the motion. Thank you, Ms Minto. And I call Maurice Golden to be followed by Willie Coffey for up to six minutes, please, Mr Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Good Food Nation Bill touches several different policy areas. So today I will focus my comments on the Bill's potential for driving progress on both sustainable agriculture and the wider environment. Where this Bill can do the most good is helping farmers answer the question. How do they produce more food whilst using fewer resources? That is the problem we face in a world where the population is rising, but the resources are dwindling. And coming up with solutions gives Scotland the opportunity to lead the world in sustainable food production. To do that, we need a better idea of the wider impact food production has on society, the economy, the environment and people's well-being. An approach being championed by NFUS and one that would let us build a picture of the food value chain, such as the condition of local supply chains, the effect imports are having and ultimately how we ensure food security. Given we have just come through a pandemic where just-in-time supply chains were stretched and food security was, at times, a genuine concern for some, there are issues the Good Food Nation Bill should put front and centre. 
alongside which farmers should be recognised as part of the solution, creating a more circular food production system that helps restore nature, protect wildlife and fight climate change. Happy to. Minister. Officer, I wonder if the member uh, could reflect just on that point about food security. Um, given it's his party in government who are signing post-Brexit trade deals, which Scottish farmers have warned will bring down standards for food and environment, uh, and indeed undermine their business, I wonder if he could reflect how that supports food security. Well, well I am quite surprised by that intervention, because every part of the UK is set to benefit from the trade agreement. Scotland exported £126 million worth of beverages to Australia in 2020, and the deal will remove tariffs of up to 5 per cent on Scotch whisky. New Zealand lamb was already quota-free before this deal. So I hope that answers the question from the member. No, I will need to move and make progress, but I understand why the, why the member did not ask me about tackling climate change, because that would be a series of failures from the Scottish Government. Three years in a row failed to meet their emissions targets. But the obvious starting point is to make farms more efficient, because more efficient farms are more sustainable farms. To do that, we need to reduce waste, for example, reducing discharges with precision fertiliser and slurry operations or closed nutrient loops to prevent nutrient loss. Fertiliser is an especially big challenge right now, the war in Ukraine having sent price skyrocketing with nitrogen nudging £1,000 per tonne. The effects of that are already being seen with farmers being persuaded to adopt regenerative practices where possible. There are environmental benefits such as boosting biodiversity, but also a potential for financial savings. Regenerative farming is able to deliver both. Of course, no system is 100 per cent efficient. There will always be waste, but we should then look to create value from those wastes, building new revenue streams for farmers, creating jobs and reducing <coughs> environmental impacts. The James Hutton Institute has been doing important work on this, looking at how farm wastes and co-products can be used to produce, for example, bioplastics, a process that has the potential to displace fossil fuels and with the associated emissions savings. In turn, that supports the aim of businesses to decarbonise their supply chains. But these solutions need help to make them work. I am pleased to say the Scottish Conservatives were ahead of the curve on this, for the past several years, we have called for direct financial and technical support for farmers to install new equipment and upgrade infrastructure. We would further assist food producers through our Scotland First strategy, encouraging public services to use local food where possible, that shortens supply chains, helps improve animal welfare and reduces environmental impacts, in turn promoting good Scottish fare and helping support over 150,000 people in the food and drink drinks supply chain. Unfortunately, the Good Food Nation Bill, as currently drafted, simply does not cover any of this in sufficient detail. We hear about public bodies producing their own Good Food Nation plans, but without knowledge exactly what they will be. Equally, there are no high-level targets or outcomes to guide individual plans, both points highlighted highlighted by the Rural Affairs Committee. I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary's assurance some of the detail will be found in the individual plans, but they need direction to support national objectives, especially environmental progress, where it seems an obvious link to the Good Food Nation Bill. But that is just not happening. Just listen to the likes of the Scottish Environment Link. They say the bill, and I quote, is significantly lacking, particularly from an environmental perspective. While well, Nourish Scotland warned that, and I quote, it is lacking in ambition and purpose. Let me be clear. I want to see food production improved, farmer supported, and an environment protected. We all do. But this current draft is too weak to do that. That must be resolved at the committee stage if we are going to build a good Food Nation. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Golden. I now call Willie Coffey, who joins us remotely, to be followed by Rhoda Grant. For up to six minutes, please, Mr Coffey. Thank you, President Officer, and I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in support of the Bill and the Committee's detailed scrutiny and report at Stage 1. 
The aims of the bill are fairly straightforward, to produce good food nation plans and to have regard to those plans when exercising other functions. I particularly enjoyed reading the section of the committee's report and what exactly having regard to actually meant, but I'll mention that later on if I get the opportunity. The principles behind the bill for me are a natural consequence of Scotland having an excellent world-class reputation for producing quality food, and taking this a step further by creating local food plans is world-leading. It is nice to think that other nations do look to Scotland to lead on how to become a good food nation, and that expectation will certainly have been enhanced by the Committee's diligence in scrutinising the Government's proposals. You can see that quite clearly if you read the report, and I am pleased to see the Bill also got the unanimous support of the Committee, albeit with a number of recommendations to strengthen it. It is quite a name to ask the nation to embrace a Good Food Nation plan that we all take pride in the food we produce and buy and cook and ultimately enjoy every day. As ever, presiding officer, the test of success will be whether it is easy to adopt across a diverse country like Scotland and how effective it will become in meeting those aims. And there was some good discussion by the committee on how that could be done too. Now, the government describes it as a framework bill and the committee looked in detail about whether it should include targets and outcomes on the face of the bill itself. From what I read, a number of targets were offered during evidence, but the committee, I think, took the reasonable view that it was not appropriate to include targets in a framework bill like this, especially when the key driver would be the development of local good food plans across the country, varied as they no doubt will be. One big issue that came up, of course, was the duty of oversight and where that should lie. It is clear from the discussion surrounding this in the report that the current proposals to lay the national plans in the Parliament and for a five-yearly progress report are not thought to be sufficient. I think it is also fair to say there was no agreement about whether a new body should provide that oversight or whether that duty could be placed on an existing body in Scotland. And I would be grateful, of course, to committee members who are speaking if they can further clarify this point. But it looks to me that some work still has to be done on that side of the bill. One aspect of the bill that took me by surprise was the proposal that there should be a statutory right to food. I was genuinely pleased to read this, of course, and the plan to incorporate this within the bill or within the human rights legislation raised quite a bit of discussion too. From what I can see, the committee supported it being contained within the human rights legislation with strong references to that right made clear within this bill. Again, presiding officer, I have to commend the committee on exploring that important aspect of a person's right to an adequate standard of living, with food clearly being a key part of this. I return briefly to the debate on what having regard to actually meant. The bill asks ministers to have regard to the National Good Food Nation Plan when exercising other duties. And the discussion seemed to centre around what this actually meant, demonstrating by evidence that the plan had been part of a wider consideration was how I read it. But I think a wise move on my part would be to leave it to other members to explain it more fully. I'm grateful to colleagues in my own council at East Ayrshire who reminded me that the committee, who reminded the committee that some authorities are already on the Good Food Nation journey, and they are recognised as one of the leading authorities in Scotland when it comes to farming, food production and celebrating good food. There are over a thousand SME food and drinks businesses across Ayrshire, and East Ayrshire is leading on the food and drink work stream of the Local Economic Partnership, and as part of the Ayrshire Growth Deal, are developing a centre of excellence to support the industry too. That, of course, was led in the early days by Robin Gourley, who was mentioned earlier, by Jenny Minto. Presiding officer, like many other members, I am extremely proud of the quality of produce coming from my part of the world here in Ayrshire, with the finest milk and dairy products on offer, as well as our quality beef, and which also gave its name to the curing process for bacon products enjoyed by so many members in the Parliament and across the world too. Lastly, 
Please also remember that it won't be too long before our famous Ayrshire panties will be on the market. And with that, presiding officer, commend the work and the, the committee on their excellent work, and look forward to the contributions from other members in the chamber. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Rhoda Grant to be followed by Karen Adam. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We are rightly proud of Scottish produce. However, our food system has huge disconnects and long food chains, leaving producers very distant from their customers. And it's often the middlemen that reap the profit. I want to focus on the issue of the human right to food and why it should be at the very heart of this bill. The Co-op Party tells us that 81% of Scots support the right to food being enshrined in Scots law. It is a government's first responsibility to ensure this, that its citizens' needs are met, and the most basic of those needs is food. We cannot be a good food nation when so many people go hungry and malnourished. Too often those who produce our food are among those who have no access to it. The Bakers Food and Allied Workers Union surveyed their members last year. 40% of respondents went hungry at some point during the pandemic because they could not afford food. These are people who are going out to work to provide our food, but their pay is not sufficient for them to buy it. And they're not alone. This is commonplace through our food industry. We see food prices subject to rampant inflation, with some staples increasing by as much as 45% in the last year, and the war in Ukraine is unlikely to make that any better. It's time for the Scottish Government to get a grip. Plans and fancy words don't feed people. We need action. The right to food should be at the heart of this bill, and with it a body charged to deliver that right, because it cannot be delivered by the free market. The idea of a I, I have a lot to cover, I'm, I'm sorry. The idea of a com commission is not new. We have several commissions and committees overseeing, advising and reporting on progress in other areas such as climate change and poverty. And as Colin Smith said, the Scottish Food Coalition argued for this at committee. They're asking for a body like the Scottish Land Commission that would advise government and other public bodies on drawing up their food plans. That body would also have act, would assess those plans for, and their implementation, and it would report to Parliament on the progress made towards Scotland becoming a good food nation. Many others, such as the Scottish Human Rights Commission, also argued for an independent body. Enshrining the right to food in a human rights bill will not change anything, because these are rights we already have, but many cannot e exercise those rights. The challenge is to give people access to the right, to make it a reality. We face a cost of living crisis, and it's only going to get worse, and the government are missing an opportunity to make a real difference to people's lives. It's not just about just hunger and how it dehumanises people. It's about the personal cost to people themselves and also the cost to society. Dealing with health inequalities caused by malnutrition costs us all dear. Prevention must be the better way. This is, issue is also more complex than simple, simply financial, although affordability plays a huge part. But we know supermarkets and are not normally situated in deprived communities. People who live there are often left to depend on more expensive smaller shops. Neither can those on a limited income afford a large food shop to be delivered to their door. It is also about the inability to access food. Older people may have had their driving licence revoked, may not be physically fit to go shopping, and they are also less likely to be online and book a shopping delivery. There is an increase of older people being admitted into hospital who are underweight and malnourished. I am sorry, I am really short of time. Um, what does this say about us as a society? We are a rich country, and yet we are seeing diseases and conditions related to malnutrition return. We are seeing an increase in obesity. We all know that processed food is cheaper than good quality food. Compare the price of pie, beans and chips with that of a roast dinner. Processed food is loaded with unhealthy fats and sugar, and yet it is affordable to those on low income. And that stores up problems for the future. Presiding officer, my colleague Elaine Smith consulted on a right to food bill and it won support in this parliament. 
Because the government parties wanted to kick the proposal into the long grass, I have similarly had to consult, and I have. But my wish would be that the right to food and a commission to oversee it, its implementation would be included in this bill. And this is where it would have maximum effect. The Scottish Government could stand proud of world-leading legislation, and I urge them to do this. And if they do, they will have the support of my party. If they don't, I will bring forward legislation. And they will have to look at the hungry people in Scotland in the eye when they vote it down. They will need to explain from their position of privilege why they cannot afford our citizens that basic human right to food. I hope they will reflect on this and ensure that all our citizens can exercise their right to food, that Scotland's wonderful produce is something we can all enjoy. Thank you. I now call Karen Adam to be followed by Liz Smith. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Adam. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. The Good Food Nation Bill could play a crucial role in setting the direction of travel towards a fair, healthy and sustainable food system in Scotland. World-leading legislation that establishes the core purpose of the food system in law, with accompanying systems of governance that ensures pro progress and accountability can catalyse a transformation and how our food system works. This has been the aim and objective of the work I have experienced as a member of the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee. By taking a whole system approach, the Good Food Nation Bill creates a revolutionary framework that ensures people's fundamental human rights and the integrity of our ecological home are promoted today and into the future. The cost of living crisis has created a growing situation where food is at the heart of some of our biggest challenges in this country. During committee, we discussed food insecurity, and this brought back forgotten memories of just how creative my own family would have to be. Not out of choice, but out of necessity. I myself spent time living in a food insecure home. I remember the innovative methods that I'd used to make a small amount of food stretch a long way to feed my entire family. You simply cannot afford what you cannot afford. And to our nation's own detriment, the most affordable foods are the ones often high in salts and natural carbohydrate sugars, particularly long-life canned and packet goods which are needed to stock food banks. This creates a whole host of societal and cultural issues, particularly feeding into the direct link between poverty and poor health outcomes. And the implementation of this bill could contribute towards combating that. I hope that through our work we have swept aside the rhetoric of the past around education as a silver bullet. Long, are go long gone are those arguments that obesity is a consequence of ignorance. From inequality, ill health and to ecological damage, I recall many pieces of evidence that shed light on a food system with a sense of injustice that the, food, the Good Food Nation Bill will address. Not least now, in the context of doing what we can when we can, to mitigate against and protect our people in Scotland who are reeling from an escalating cost of living crisis, we are seeing people who maybe for the first time are being priced out of a decent diet. They are reliant on food banks and who are suffering the consequences of malnutrition and food insecurity. Engaging with this piece of work has and will be invaluable. This legislation, supported by existing rights and fleshed out as the cost of living crisis grows, will and has to make progress. Whole generations are growing up hungry. Children's educational attainment is being affected. Opportunities are being denied and potential is not being realised. It would be true to say that in the Rural Affairs, Islands and Natural Environment Committee's deliberations, there has been a tension in our discussions around setting targets within the legislation. Part of the problem is what targets actually mean in this situation. This piece of work should be led and delivered holistically and not by the nose of targets, and I'll explain why. The rollout of the Good Food Nation Bill can be led by seeing the positive impact of our changing culture around food. This wraparound approach gives a flexibility and vision to how performance is measured, a path not focusing upon targets that could restrict and narrow our performance outcomes. 
the here today, gone tomorrow targets that become meaningless in a rapidly changing landscape will not assist the path of this bill into practice and lived experience. People who are experiencing food poverty aren't concerned about targets, but on actual performance and their own personal reality of easy access to good food. Facilitating this more holistic approach underpins the work being done already, and this give, gives a legislative basis. Parents are going out to work without having eaten enough because they have given up meals so that their children can eat. What an indictment this is of our political and economic system. That must change, and this bill addresses that. As we now know only too well in our contemporary context, the social, economic and political landscape could change dramatically, even in the coming months. Asking what could be used as markers for outcomes from the law, we must not fall into the trap of targets becoming the focus, rather than driving fundamental culture change. We must value the people who work to produce and process food and the farm animals, the wildlife and natural resources which enable us to eat well. We need a just transition to a food system founded on the principles of social and environmental justice. And this bill again will do that. We need local authorities to play their part in also supporting this change in ways which drive forward a nation and a cultural movement for getting back to growers which can be supported by including allotments and community gardens in planning decisions. Growing supports our environment, our mental health objectives. It can be therapy and community bonding for young and old alike. It provides green spaces for people to enjoy. We saw how important that was, particularly during the pandemic. So, in conclusion, President Officer, to imagine a nation of good food that we can all support with a framework bill this includes a vision of a country where we can appreciate and take part in the process of farm to fork, boat to bowl and propagation to our plate. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Liz Smith to be followed by Jim Fairley. Up to six minutes, please, Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, there are numerous reasons why it is a privilege uh, to live in Scotland, but for me there are three worth mentioning in the context of this debate. The unique splendour of our landscapes, particularly on days like today when it's not raining, the abundance of our natural resources and our capacity to produce world-class food. And I thought Colin Smith uh, made some interesting points about the potential that we have. Good food is a very large part of being able to live well. Therefore, it goes without saying that we must harness everything in our power to ensure that it is accessible to all. Without good food, there is no access to good health, to a strong economy and to a strong sense of well-being. Now, this chamber knows only too well that over the years I have generally been pretty hostile towards national plans of any sort because past experience with plans in this place has not been encouraging. Too many national plans have been overlain with too much bureaucracy and burdens on stakeholder groups, with artificial targets and with situations where we have ended up with people being told by the state what to do rather than for taking their own responsibility. So by, before I comment on this particular plan, I want to concentrate on three themes that are within the bill, uh, which I believe can be the focus for the desired aim, namely to ensure that Scotland is a world leader when it comes to good food. And uh, these th three themes are very much around the availability of food, the production and its preparation. Now, firstly, on the question of availability, it's not just about the supply of food but it's about how pricing affects consumer demand and the related elasticities within that demand. Because all too often, and it's a bit of a myth, people tell us that good food is always going to be more expensive. That is simply not true. Indeed, some of the best and most wholesome food is actually the cheapest. Take homemade soup. I've heard Mr Fairley on this uh, point uh, during the election campaign and in the chamber since. Take, take the homemade soup situation with quality vegetables that we have in our local shops and on our farms, William, William Coffey made the point, uh, and a traditional uh, dish of uh, Scottish mince and tatties can be as good as any when it comes to quality food, and it's a lot cheaper than a fish supper or a pizza carryout. So too with a myriad of straightforward recipes which make... Yes, of course. I, Alistair Allen. I thank the member for giving way in bow to no one and my respect for mince and tatties. However, given what you say about making a bowl of soup, does she recognise that in many communities in Scotland, actually accessing a shop which sells fresh vegetables is no simple task? 
Absolutely, uh, Mr. Allen, I absolutely do. And I'm coming to a point, uh, again, going back to uh, some of the suggestions that Mr. Fairley's had in the past. You're quite right. And it's not just about accessing that. It's about actually knowing what to do when it comes to making the soup. That's the important point as well. And I think when it comes to the education that's involved in this, uh, I think that is absolutely crucial. I don't often agree with Mr. Fairley in this chamber, as everybody knows, but I think he's made a very strong point in the past uh, about um, young people in schools knowing what they have to do. And I think it's a very important part of the curriculum that we should be educating our young people and indeed how to avoid uh, waste. Um, now, I'm obviously uh, not a farmer by any sense, but I do live in, in the farming communities in Persia and I, I live in awe of what they manage to do, often against the elements and in very difficult circumstances. And yes, it's absolutely true that they've had their difficulties with Brexit and with COVID, and as such, they've not had their troubles to seek. But they also have some big asks of us. Um, top of the list for them, quite rightly, is that they want us uh, to buy local, and that includes local authorities and other institutions doing their bit when it comes to uh, procurement. And that is something, as Rachel Hamilton rightly said, the Scottish Conservatives have been calling for this for a very long time. That procurement is absolutely vital, not just in terms of harnessing the best of our local areas, but in terms of supporting jobs and the uh, related rural industries. So if the bill is going to be effective, facilitating that local procurement is an absolute key component. But of course, there, there's another important issue here, and that is the culture which surrounds uh, the preparation of the food. Far too often these days, mealtimes are squeezed. And there are two problems in this. It, it often means that poorer quality uh, food is being served. I think Karen Adam made this uh, very sensible point. And it certainly means that quality family time around the dinner table it, is often reduced. And personally, I think the French have got a lot uh, to teach us in trying to address that issue, because food in France is very much seen as a national treasure. And I think we need to do an awful lot more uh, to imbue exactly the same culture across Scotland. So quite a bit of it is, is about attitudinal changes, and we know from various other policy aspects in this chamber, changing attitudes and behaviour is not easy, but I don't think we should just sit back and say that we're not going to try. Because I think that the committee has come up with some very interesting suggestions about what the basket of indicators has to be, as opposed to the actual targets. I think that's a very important part of the recommendations of the committee report. And I also, and I want to finish on this point, I think uh, Beatrice Wishart, on behalf of the um, committee, raised some very interesting points about the procedures that the committee will have to uh, recommend to the Parliament to ensure that we are going about this legislation in absolutely the right way, so that we are actually delivering what the intention is, rather than getting wound up in some legislation that is actually not going to be very effective. So I'll leave it there, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Jim Fairley to be followed by Ariane Burgess. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Fairley. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And, uh, not often that I would agree with Liz Smith, but there was so much in there that I would absolutely agree with. Um, so I'm going to take in a wee history lesson of my involvement with this whole debate, uh, President Officer. In 1995, the Aberdeen Evening Express reported on a chip shop in Stonehaven selling Mars bars deep fried in batter during the school holidays, specially targeted at children. It was a novelty story. It was picked up by the press across the country and around the world. It was described in one newspaper as Scotland's craziest takeaway, but it became synonymous with obesity, ill health and a high-fat diet, doing nothing to enhance the already poor reputation for Scotland's appreciation of and relationship with food. The irony is that Scotland's larder, as we've already talked about, is world-renowned and has been for generations. The lamb, the beef, venison, salmon, shellfish, whisky, potatoes, haggis, neeps, the world knows all about our loved home produce. Yet we, st we still had the reputation for being the sick man of Europe with a very unhealthy relationship with alcohol and fatty obesity inducing foods. It Absolutely. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful to Mr Phil for taking intervention. I wonder if you'd agree with me that in, in considering this we have to look at planning and where we put fast food outlets and whether or not we allow things like burger vans anywhere close to our schools so we can encourage our children to, 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 to an uptake of school meals. Absolutely, it was something I called for when I was on the outside of this chamber, so I completely agree with that. Um, it didn't add up, and someone had to take an, uh, an initiative to change 
the, the attitude that we had and the, the obesity challenges that we had. Hungry for Success as a national nutritional standards programme for schools was launched in 2003 in a bid to tackle the highest level of obesity in Europe, and that was a significant step forward. Then came Schools Health Promotion and the Nutrition Scotland Act of 2007. And it remains the overarching legislation around food provision and a whole school approach to promoting health and well-being. A review of the regulations took place in 2017 and were revised again in 2021, meaning that schools now take account of health and well-being planning and we introduce universal free school meals in primary schools and this is to promote social justice and as a vital service as the cost of living crisis that we are facing takes hold. Now, I have spoken before in my experience working with Perth High School to help them develop as a health promoting school and the programme we set up giving young people access to and participation in whole food chain processes from growing to preparing to cooking and then selling. What those young people got out of that was life skills and an introduction to vibrant, exciting industry with the possibility of developing a career for themselves. My involvement at that level with my children's school was mainly down to a changing attitude and culture around food across schools and local authorities, driven by these various governmental initiatives, and in particular, the 2008 National Food and Drink Policy for Scotland. Now, this was a landmark piece of work from Richard Lockhead and the first of its kind in Europe. I'm not going to quote what he said because I don't have time. In 2009, Robin Gourley chaired the National Food and Drink Policy's Public Sector Working Group, aimed at creating new opportunities for food and drink, SMEs and better public procurement by the public sector organisations. His success in East Ayrshire meant that he was the right person to chair this group, looking at how we could put the talk into action. And the report he authored was aptly called Walking the Talk, Getting Government Right. In that report, Sustainable Development and Accounting for Social, Economic and Environmental Value of Food and Awarding Contracts was introduced, as was the social return on investment. These were two vital elements in driving the move away from pence per meal to deliver wider value for money across society, a crucial difference in changing attitudes to the real value of food in public procurement. Seeing the whole picture from legislation in this place to working with it in the fields, if you'll pardon the pun, has been of huge value and emphasises to me why we need to get it right. Our global reputation for quality food is fabulous. Our imagery and marketing have been superb. The Scotch Whisky Association were undoubtedly front runners. I'm sorry, I don't have time. Undoubtedly front runners, and others are learning from them. The Scottish Government's genius and cooperation of Scotland Food and Drink to be that collaborative linchpin for the whole food industry under the stewardship of James Withers has been a massive success. Our reputation for quality places to eat out in Scotland is growing, led, I'm very proud to say, by my brother's restaurant at Glen Eagles and still the only two Michelin star restaurant in Scotland. Appreciation of our homegrown and local food offering has grown massively, and again, I'm proud of my own small role in establishing Scotland's first farmers' market, which led to an explosion of farmers' markets across the country, farm shops, local food delivery businesses, and creating that connection between growers, farmers, fishers and producers and consumers has been pivotal, pivotal in getting us to where we are now. Our street food culture has equally grown exponentially. Small artisan traders getting out there and cooking fabulous tasting, locally sourced, top quality foods. A world away from when I started Festival Catering, where organisers now recognise that quality food is something to be proud of and an important element of any uh, event. Now, I mention all this to emphasise that we are on a journey. A journey that we have been on for a long time and one which we have made great strides and improvements. And there is a, a danger in this debate that we are dismissing all that has gone before without recognising its value and, importantly, its lessons. So, President Officer, we have come an extremely long way in a relatively short period of time, but there is much more to do, and that is where this Good Food Nation Bill comes in. Its requirement to set out a plan has been criticised for lacking ambition, for being too narrow, for not having targets and for missing an opportunity. I disagree because these claims are missing the fundamental point of what has already been achieved. This bill is the next stage to embed and boost all of that good work. It is a framework bill that will focus the minds of those in the public sector to ensure every aspect of their thinking has a regard to food and its role in every function of their operation. Across all departments, local authorities will have to take cognizance of all these aspects and include them in their thinking. I will finish there. The bill strengthens the levers for change and continues the cultural shift that Scotland has been on for over two decades. When we look back in five years' time, we will be able to measure success by improved health, economic development and the cultural shifts we witness in everyday life and how Thank much you. closer we are being to being a good food nation. Thank, Thank you, you. Mr Fairley.
Uh, I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Faisal Chowdhury. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Burgess. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Getting food right in Scotland will play a crucial role in our country's well-being. The Good Food Nation Bill is not just about what's on our plates. It's about every single activity that puts food onto that plate and what happens when the scraps are scraped off the plate and the plate is washed. Food entwines many systems. It engages thousands of people in sectors from soil science to food growing and harvesting, fishing and farming, through to cooking and serving, preparing and packaging, delivery and retail. It involves all of us as we all buy and eat food. Food is at the centre of our lives. We must recognise that the way we produce, procure and value good food can help us make massive strides in response to our climate and nature emergencies, our health and education crises, and our growing food insecurity and mental ill health challenges. That's why the Scottish Greens ensured commitments to support better procurement and organic farming in the Butte House Agreement. For years, countless people and organisations across Scotland, as Jim Fairley has just outlined, have been pushing for this Good Food Nation Bill. Why? Because until now, we haven't been doing such a great job at providing genu genuinely nutritious food for people. We need this Good Food Nation Bill to help us all do better. This bill can be strengthened at stage two. The 45 organisation strong Scottish Food Coalition, Coalition states in its response to the RAIN Committee's report that the bill must be strengthened as it currently has no clear goals, principles or direction and minimal mechanisms for participation and accountability. The majority of people who gave evidence to the committee agreed that the bill needs more detail, clearer ambition, clarity of vision, outcomes and levers for change. I'd like to highlight key areas where public bodies can be supported to develop and deliver on strong Good Food Nation plans and signal to the private sector the clear change in direction that we must make. Firstly, a purpose statement at the start of the bill would make clear the direction the Scottish food policy should be heading. Anna Taylor, who gave evidence to the committee, the Chief Independent Advisor on England's National Food Strategy, called for a statement which sets out the benefits of a Good Food Nation will bring to people, animals and our environment, and that the role that we want food to play in society and our lives. Stakeholders have suggested this could be underpinned by a list of high-level objectives, as we've heard discussed already, and a set of outcomes, such as addressing the environmental impact of food production and the level of food insecurity in society. Just like the outcomes in the Island Acts, these will function as guide rails to help ensure that the plans all move us towards the same shared vision of a good food nation, while leaving room for different policy approaches to getting there as appropriate to different regions. One necessary outcome I would like to highlight in increasing the share of, the, the share of local food procured by public bodies. This is reflected in commitments we will now be delivering from the Butte House Agreement. Supporting Scottish producers and supply chains through public procurement is essential for increasing food security, which is becoming ever more critical as shown by the war in Ukraine, and it will also boost our health and local economies and protect our climate and nature. Support must be put in place to enable local authorities to pull on this important lever. In evidence, people highlighted the need to provide advice and guidance to the public and private sectors, to benchmark and measure progress, and to involve citizens, food workers and stakeholder groups in inclusive processes to develop informed and effective food policy. An independent oversight body could play an important role here. Several stakeholders have called for a Scottish Food Commission with a role and remit similar to the Scottish Land Commission. Others have used the comparison of the UK Climate Change Committee, a purpose-built cross-cutting body with expertise in all aspects of climate change. We need a body with wide-ranging expertise like that for food, another cross-cutting issue. And I'm grateful that the Cabinet Secretary has indicated that she is considering the oversight body. Finally, we heard interesting arguments from several stakeholders 
that the Bill should recognise the proposed right to food. And I am pleased that this crucial right is expected to soon be incorporated into Scots law through the Scottish Government's Human Rights Bill. In closing, Presiding Officer, I trust I have expressed the urgency for Scotland to become a good food nation. We all have a lot on our plates, but we must use this opportunity to strengthen this vital bill to ensure that the Good Food Nation plans and policies serve up the outcomes we all know we need for our health, our food security and our planet. Thank you. I now call, call Faisal Chowdhury to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, De Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, I must first refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest. Uh, as many members will know, I come from a background in the food business, and the issues of good food is one that is close to my heart. I must commend the work of the committee in examining this bill and allowing us to now debate its merit. The stated aims of this bill is its policy memorandum sound very novel, to commit to Scotland producing, selling and eating good food, to see dietary diseases in decline, to encourage healthy and environmentally sound food productions. However, what we have before us lacks significant details, even when uh, we take into consideration that this is a framework bill. As the committee's report note, Scottish ministers have admitted that they did not have to legislate the create good food plans for Scotland, but they wanted to give the plans teeth. We are therefore left to wonder why are the ways in which the Good Food Nation plans may be not made clearer in the bill. I agree with the Scottish Food Coalition assessment that there should be, at the very least, be a purpose on the face of this bill. That purpose should ensure the right to food as one of the first principles when it comes to good food, surely all else must f flow from that. That's because even more relevant given the cost of living crisis people now face. But there could also be some much more. The, so the Scottish Food Coalition also suggests including objectives based around the UN's sustainable development goals into the bill. We could even ensure and protect Scotland's place as a fair trade nation in the bill, ensuring that we are considering sustainable development across the world when we import the food that we cannot grow ourselves. The fact that there is much vision in the bills before us feels like a missed opportunity. There is also a wider point here about the Scottish Government's legislative agenda. The, the cross-party group on international development last week heard about the prospect for a well-being and sustainable development bill, also promised in the SNP manifesto at the last election. That bill is apparently intended to ensure policy coherence on sustainable development within the Scottish Government's legislative and regulatory approaches to governing. How then are the principles of well-being and sustainable development not reflected within this bill? Will this bill have to be amended by that one? Of course, it is upon all of us here to uh, foresee these problems and deal with them at later stage. But I worry that it shows a lack of joining up thinking in the Scottish Government's approach to the framework it seeks to build. We must also ensure that this framework bill provides adequate room for this Parliament to scrutinise the Scottish Government's plan. As the several of these respondent to the consultation on the bill have noted. This is another aspect that is sorely lacking from what we see in front of us. 
It was only a few weeks ago that mainly, uh, many of us uh, here uh, were criticizing the UK internal market bill and the reliance on common frameworks that shut this parliament out of decision making on matters of great importance to Scotland. We should not accept another framework being created that shuts this parliament out of decision and only adds an executive power. And this is something that needs dealing with in later stage. In, conclu in conclusion, my, my assessment is that the principles behind this bill are admirable, but it is held back by a lack of imagination into the good that it could do and by a lack of avenue for scrutiny when it comes to the involvement of this parliament. Should we agree to, to it today, we should also take with us the determination to repair this at the later stage. On this basis, I'll be voting in favour of this general principle of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Colette Stevenson, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. I remind members of my register of interests. Scotland is a nation with excellent food, and with the right frameworks in place, we can take full advantage of this. Scotland can become a good food nation where everyone takes pride and pleasure in and benefits from the food they produce, buy, cook and eat every day. I welcome the introduction of the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill and support everything it sets out to do. As an overarching framework bill, it will not only underpin the work that the Scottish Government is already doing, but will also put the Good Food Nation plans on a legislative, legislative footing and ensure we maximise the benefits from our natural larder. There are the obvious health benefits, both physical and mental, of eating and having access to good food. Moves towards more sustainable and local products also benefit the environment with lower food miles. It will also sustain and create more local jobs. That is why it is important that there is a duty for ministers to consider all of these factors set out in Section 1 of the Bill. Food is a huge industry and East Kilbride is home to many businesses in the sector, some local, some global. We have a long-standing tradition of dairy businesses around East Kilbride and that is still the case today. Thornton Hall Farmhouse Ice Cream is a family business. They keep their own dairy cows, milk them and make excellent fresh ice cream. McQueen's Dairies delivers fresh milk and other products, all sourced from a farm-owned cooperative. One of the dangers of unhealthy food and eating lots of it is the salt content. Low salt, based in East Kilbride, is helping to tackle that through their low-sodium products. Many public services like hospitals, schools and nurseries provide food, arguably some of the most important meals. The Bill will expand on the work to improve the nutritional content of food from public kitchens as well as increase the use of locally sourced and produced foods as an important step in creating a good food nation. Key to this is good procurement. The Supplier Development Programme does great work and I would encourage small businesses in East Kilbride and across Scotland to do their free tender training. Councils and other public sector agencies take out large food contracts for schools, care homes, hospitals and cafes. There are big companies with dedicated tendering officers, the means to bid for multi-million pound contracts and to sort the necessary logistics. Small businesses can struggle to bid for large contracts and often rely on subcontracted opportunities. Without good supply chain visibility, however, it is difficult to see the local benefits and know the source of the different food products supplied. Beef, for instance, no, I'd like to have, still get a lot to go through. Beef, for instance, might be frozen from the other side of the world, or it might have been sourced a mile down the road. Sometimes large companies cite commercial sensitivity and refuse to divulge details of subcontractors. 
I would like to see supply chain visibility increased, whether that is by promotion and encouragement or through guidance or legislation. This is vital so that politicians, policymakers, businesses and customers can see where food comes from, consider the jobs that are getting created and supported locally and see the community benefit from these large contracts. The proposed Community Wealth Building Bill will develop procurement practices to support local economies, including small businesses. It will also encourage school canteens to use more foods produced locally. As a nation, sometimes we are not the best at taking advantage of our natural larder. I believe Scots should eat more Indigenous foods. This would boost our economy and help support a good food nation. As the Cabinet Secretary knows, I have a constituency interest in lowland deer management. Venison is local, sustainable, healthy food. But the way things are right now, it is not a protein that many people could afford to eat much of. Given the lack of localised larders, the high cost perhaps reflects the long-winded path to process venison. From my discussions with deer managers, that cost could be reduced drastically with the right support and a more localised approach. I hope with improved procurement and a bigger focus on local food that we'll, we will see some benefits on that front. President Officer, I support the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill. It provides the framework to ensure that Scots from every walk of life can benefit from and take pride in the food they produce, buy, cook, serve and eat every day. Thank you. We will now move to closing statements and I call on Mercedes Vialba uh, to wind up on behalf of Scottish Labour. Up to six minutes, please, Ms Vialba. The whole glass of water. Sorry. <laughs> Great. I have spilt the water. Now I can get started. Um, I would like to um, thank colleagues on the committee and um, everyone who contributed evidence um, in helping to produce uh, the, the committee's report. I think it's clear that there's broad support across the country and within Parliament today for the principles underlining the Good Food Nation Bill. And that's important because as the cost of living crisis deepens and more people across Scotland are faced with the realities of food insecurity, transformative change within our food system is long overdue. But the food insecurity which so many now face is not just being driven by the current cost of living crisis, it has been allowed to develop by political choices made over the last decade. The choice of our governments not to tackle low pay or insecure work or inadequate social security provision. But with this bill, we have an opportunity to transform our food system to take action to end food poverty in Scotland. But in order to do so, I think it's clear that the bill must be strengthened in a number of areas. As we've heard today from Rachel Hamilton throughout the committee's evidence sessions, the idea of incorporating a right to food into Scots law through the bill was repeatedly raised. It's something which is being called for by campaigners like those from the Scottish Food Coalition um, and the Bakers Union. As the bill stands, these campaigners are rightly concerned that it lacks a clear purpose and will do little to bring effect to the right to food, even if it is introduced in future human rights legislation. The General Secretary of the Bakers Union, Sarah Woolley, expressed this concern when she said, no good food nation bill in 2022 can be taken seriously without a statutory commitment to deliver a right to food. So I hope the Scottish Government will reflect on the need for the bill to be given a clearer purpose ahead of stage two. And as Colin Smith outlined, this could be achieved, as suggested by campaigners, through the introduction of a purpose clause in the bill, making it clear that the bill will give effect to the right to food. I also believe that the bill needs high level objectives that would help to guide the implementation and measure the success of Good Food Nation plans. We heard earlier in the debate from Karen Adam that people in food poverty don't care about targets, they care about actual outcomes. Now, that might be true, 
but without the targets, we have no way to mandate and measure the change we need to see. Because as the bill currently stands, there's no requirement for the Good Food Nation plans to have objectives and indicators in relation to the wider food system. So that means no mandate to support sustainable agriculture or to improve animal welfare or to enhance paying conditions within food supply chains. And it means no indicators which can be used to measure the success of Good Food Nation plans. So if we're serious about transforming Scotland into a good food nation, which I think we all are today, then we must take a system-wide approach to food policy which addresses these issues. Um, we also heard earlier from Ariane Burgess about calls from campaigners for a purpose-built cross-cutting Scottish Food Commission. Now, like them, I believe there is a role for a statutory oversight body to monitor the development and implementation of Good Food Nation plans. As Rhoda Grant highlighted, such an independent oversight body could not only provide scrutiny of Good Food Nation plans, but also contribute to their development through actions like research support. The body could also improve accountability by supporting Parliament in its scrutiny of the National Good, uh, Good Food Nation Plan and the Scottish Government's overall progress towards delivering a Good Food Nation. Now, back in August, the Scottish Government recognised there might be a role for such an oversight body to monitor the delivery of Good Food Nation plans, and so I hope they will now look again at including proposals for such a body ahead of Stage 2. Presiding Officer, while Labour support the principles underpinning the Good Food Nation Bill, we believe it's clear that the Bill should be strengthened. The Bill should be given a clearer purpose to give effect to a right to food, it should include high-level objectives and indicators to help with the development of Good Food Nation plans and to measure their success. And it should provide for a statutory independent oversight body. Now, the Scottish Government has a political choice to make. Will it push forward with an empty framework or will it work with campaigners and cross-party to create a bill fit to bring about the transformational system change our nation needs? Thank you. Thank you. And I now call on Brian Whittle to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Up to seven minutes, please, Mr Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am delighted to be closing this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. I think, as many in this chamber will know, bringing forward the Good, Good Food Nation Bill is something I have pushed for long and weary in this place through all the false dawns promised by the Government as they kicked the can down the road for years. It is a hugely important piece of legislation with potentially significant impacts across all portfolios and across all of society. It is brought forward against the backdrop of Scotland being the unhealthiest nation in Europe, second most obese country in the world after the USA, as well as many other poor health indicators, which I have to say, tell to the Cabinet Secretary is worse than it was seven years ago. So I'm not quite sure where she, she can claim that over the last seven years we've become a good food nation, but I'd be really interested to see where the evidence for that comes from. And this is despite our farmers producing some of the highest quality food in the world. The Scottish Government has a target to reduce childhood obesity by 50% by 2030, but there's no mention of this on the bill and no route of how they would achieve this target. Now, I would suggest that the Good Food Nation Bill should at least acknowledge that food will have a bearing on this target. The impact of getting this right are many. The obvious health links, making sure our children have access to the highest quality locally produced food, because adult health outcomes are developed in early years. This applies at preschool, where introducing a level playing field uh, for the rollout of our 140 hours should include funding for healthy meals. But we do know that the PVI sector is being squeezed by the current Scottish Government deal. This will inevitably put pressure on those nurseries to deliver quality food. Our free school meals should most definitely be locally sourced and of the highest nutritional standard. And I think we should be encouraging that uptake of school meals. And I think, as I said in the intervention earlier on, on that we need to look at the planning as to where we put fast food outlets and, wh and whether we allow things like burger vans outside of schools. In education, as Liz Smith quite rightly pointed out, and it's such an important point, learning about good nutrition is key. And it's key because it, it leads to good learning and of closing the, the attainment gap. And linked to this, who would have thought that agreeing with Jim Fairley in this chamber, both Liz Smith and I agreeing with Jim Fairley, that's the end of his political, political career. He called for those to be made, uh, there to be more education in schools about the value of food, the health, wellbeing and environment provision 
should be more should be provided on the bill. And we agree. We agree, Mr. Fairley. So, what about supporting a rural economy by local procurement policies, as demonstrated by East Ayrshire, who sit at about 75% locally procured food for schools? Five years ago, I did a study as to where local council schools and hospital food came from, and, as there is, and the results were as astounding as they were damning, with only 16 per cent of food procured into the Scottish Government Central XL contract coming from Scotland, with quality of food in some areas, especially our main cities, being particularly poor. And I think that, 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 that points to the point that Rachel Hamilton made about the fact that the Scottish diet has become calorie-dense and nutritionally poor. And, and of course, there was Morris Golden, that guru of the circular economy, spoke knowledgeably about the opportunity we have to develop a sustainable food economy and decarbonise our food supply. So we need to reduce the miles that our food has to travel from processing and consumption, which can only benefit the environment. While we are on this subject, targeting food waste should surely have been put on the bill. After all, we throw away about a third of our food, and all the while we are debating about how we tackle food poverty. If it were a country, food waste would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gas after China and the USA. And as Jenny Minto pointed out, we require an area the size of China to produce all the food we discard. And there is no mention of that on the bill. No, presenting officer. In bringing forward this bill, the Scottish Government have avoided, I think, all the real issues that the Good Food Nation Bill should be addressing. Instead, it is another smoke and mirrors unicorns and rainbows. In fact, all this is to me is the Scottish Government just saying that they want councils to come up with a plan, all the while making sure there is nothing that they can be measured against. Where is the financial memorandum to support our local authorities? The bill should have clear purpose. It should link up food production with processing and procurement and then reducing food waste. Ensuring that there is adequate and culturally acceptable food consumed sustainably, preserving access to food for future generations. It should not only contain clear targets, but a route to get there and a way to measure progress against those targets. I will take an intervention. Mr. Can you explain to me how you legislate for how people eat and how you change culture? How do you legislate for that? Brian Bruton. What you do, Mr Fairley, is create an environment where we encourage our children to eat school meals. We create an environment where we educate. No, it's not. We educate. You have to legislate and create a framework that allows that to happen. And this, I've got to say, the, what, I tell you what the Scottish Government are really good at. They're really good at setting world-leading targets yeah. without any practical way of achieving them. But, Mr Fairley, see, in this instance, they haven't even bothered to do that. The Scottish, the, Sc uh, I've just, no, I've got time. the Scottish Food Coalition is damning in its briefing on this bill, saying that it has no clear goals, principles or direction, with minimal mechanism for participation and accountability. Presenting officer, this bill is not only years late in being laid, it is a shadow of what it could and should be. Somehow it has made its way through the Scottish Government machine, it has been trampled on, it has been kicked about and reduced to a next-to-nothing bill. What an opportunity, Mr. Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government have a lot of work to do before this bill has any real meaning. No wonder the Scottish Government insists that they mark their own homework, because if anyone else did it, they would be lucky to get an F. What this debate has exposed is the Scottish, uh, Scottish Government's need to get back to the drawing board, do the job you are supposed to do, and produce a bill worthy of the title. Presiding Officer. Thank you. And I now call on Mary Goujon, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up on behalf of the Scottish Government. Up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I really just want to start by thanking all the members who have taken part in the debate this afternoon. Food is fundamental to all of our lives. It touches us right across society, across government. You can see this from the sheer breadth of organisations and interests who gave evidence to the committee and just from the sheer range of issues that have been uh, raised across the, uh, the chamber today uh, during the course of the debate. Now, as I mentioned at the start, Scotland has been on a Good Food Nation journey now for many years. We have taken many important steps in improving people's lives through food policy, from tackling issues around health and diet to addressing the environmental impact of food. And this bill isn't intended to be the culmination of that journey. It's the next important step in it. And I think Jim Fairley made this point really well in his contribution today, because we can't forget or dismiss the work that has led us here or forget what's come before. Now, this legislation ensures that government can be held to account by everyone who is affected by food policy decisions through the creation of new and innovative national and local food plans. 
Now, there were so many different issues that were raised during the course of today. I really want to try and cover as much as I possibly can in closing. And one of those was food security. And this was touched on by a, a couple of members. Uh, it was raised by Jenny Minto and by Maurice Golden as, as well. Because I think the horrific events that we've watched unfold in the Ukraine over the past few weeks, I think, has brought all of this uh, into sharp focus. We've recognised, as a government, the importance of our primary producers and food production, which is why that is one of the key pillars that we set out in our vision for agriculture. That's why the Good Food Nation Bill is mentioned within that vision, as well as our local food strategy, and why we have committed to continuing to support our food producers. Now, we, uh, not at the moment. We live in a country that is so plentiful in terms of, the, of what we produce, and we often talk about the fantastic natural larder that we have. But in spite of that, we also had the powerful interventions today that were made by Karen Adam and by Rhoda Grant about the food insecurity that people face, the levels of ill health and, and malnutrition. And I think that one of the things that shocked me in going through the evidence as well, and that Brian Whittle touched on in his contribution, was about food waste and the, some of the statistics that we heard from Zero Waste Scotland when they were giving evidence to the committee about the sheer levels uh, of food that we see going to waste in this country. So we produce so much good food, but how do we make that accessible? How do we reduce food waste? How do we build a food system that works, that's fair to our farmers and crofters, that's connected through short supply chains and better connecting people to their food and where it comes from? Yes. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that. Um, we heard from SNP backbenchers um, about the need to shorten supply chains, which you've just mentioned, and to ensure that smaller producers get a look in when they are um, being successful in that procurement process. Does the Cabinet Secretary support a wholesale reform of procurement in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. We're looking at issues in relation to uh, shortening supply chains, which I'll also come to touch on, and which we're considering through our draft local food strategy too. Now, in relation to trying to address some of those questions that I set out, this bill will underpin what we're already doing on food policy, but it's also going to give us the extra tools that we need to maintain momentum and to really increase that synergy of food policy uh, between the national and the local. And this bill is important in helping us to really affect the changes that we know we need to see in our food culture and how we think about food and the food we choose to eat. And this can only be achieved through long-term planning that links government activity with that of other public bodies like local authorities and health boards. Now, in touching on some of the other issues that were raised today, the right to food was a topic on which there were very strong feelings expressed. And I know that some stakeholders in giving evidence on this, such as Food, uh, such as food Train, had expressed their disappointment that a delay to incorporating the right to food is a delay in protecting human rights, whereas others, such as Nourish Scotland, had commented that the right to food needs to be incorporated as soon as possible, while also understanding the, understanding the reasons for including it in a broader human rights bill. Now, I really just want to reiterate my view that I absolutely agree that the right to food should be incorporated into Scots law. I don't think there's any disagreement about that uh, across the chamber. But as I noted in evidence, given that human rights are indivisible in so many ways, including the right to adequate food in the Human Rights Bill, provides the best opportunity to address these complex interrelationships and it avoids a fragmented approach to the incorporation of human rights. And this is something we've committed to. So while the right to adequate food will be put into law as part of future legislation in this parliamentary session, the Good Food Nation Bill presents us with the opportunity to help make that access to healthy, local and nutritious food a reality for all of the people of Scotland. Now, there were a couple of other points that were raised in the debate today that I want to touch on, some that were raised by Beatrice Wisher in relation to the role of local authorities. I, not at the moment, I just want to I need to continue to make progress. Beatrice Wishart talked about local authorities being at different stages in development of food policy, asking what more we could do in this regard to assist. And I want to give the assurance that we are giving further consideration as to how we can help with that. And we will continue to work closely with local authorities and with COSLA. And that's also in relation to the finances, which I know was an issue that was raised at, at committee too. In relation to targets, again, points that were touched on by Brian Whittle and by Maurice Golden and others across the chamber today. I understand why there are calls for including targets in this bill. 
That question was discussed extensively during the evidence sessions at the committee. Stakeholders ranging from the Scottish Food Coalition to the Royal College of Nursing, among many others, had given examples of targets that they would have liked to have seen in the bill. Each of these food policy targets is important. However, we firmly believe that the best place for those targets is in our plans, following widespread and inclusive consultation with all of our stakeholders. Now, Good Food Nation covers such a broad range of policy areas, each of which contributes a basket of potential targets. Now, these could never all be adequately captured on the face of this bill, but limiting to a subset of specific targets risks that the Good Food Nation plans, not at the moment, end up focused narrowly on those targets to the detriment of other food policy ambitions. Now, I know this was a concern that was also articulated in evidence the committee heard, uh, that targets become the focus, which means the wider ambitions suffer. And that was a point that was well articulated by Karen Adam in her contribution today. We also need to retain the flexibility to amend and update targets as we progress, and constantly having to update primary legislation wouldn't easily uh, allow for that to happen. In relation to parliamentary scrutiny, again, a point that had been raised today, Linked to the discussion on uh, oversight is the role that Parliament can play. And again, this had been highlighted by Beatrice Wisher, amongst other members. Now, I absolutely appreciate the importance of the role that Parliament plays in providing scrutiny. And I also note the committee's recommendations in that regard. I've taken on board the committee's recommendations and I'm actively considering how to enhance that role that Parliament will play in the development and scrutiny of the National Good Food Nation Plan. There were also points in, raised in relation to a food commission, and I'd like to begin with responding to that question of whether a new statutory body should be set up in the context of Good Food Nation plans. There were a wide range of views that were expressed in response to the committee's call for evidence, as well as during the committee's stage one evidence sessions. Some, such as the Scottish Food Coalition, have been very clear that there has to be that independent oversight, whereas others, such as COSLA, don't believe that a new body is required to oversee the implementation of the bill. The evidence given to the committee included a range of views of the, the pros and cons of a new body, its governance and its functions, but there wasn't any general agreement on the need for such a body. We've committed to considering the need for a statutory body, such as a Food Commission, as part of the Butte House Agreement, and we're considering all the options that are available to provide that oversight role for delivery of the provisions in the Good Food Nation Bill. In closing, Presiding Officer, in its first year, the Scottish Food Commission published an interim report which refreshed the vision for a good food nation. That vision still holds true today. It sits at the heart of the premise for this bill and it will be reflected in the high level objectives that the national and local plans will seek to deliver. But there's one key ambition that is set out that it's hard to legislate for. I would ask you to close, Minister. Yes. Other countries look to Scotland to learn how to become a good food nation. Presiding officer, there's already been intense international interest in what Scotland is doing. It was a privilege indeed to have the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food give evidence on our bill and its proposals. People are excited by the scale of our ambition and our willingness to legislate to achieve it, something which few nations have done. So I look forward to the next station of, uh, stages of Scotland's Good Food Nation Bill, just continuing to cooperate and collaborate during stages two and three to arrive at a final bill that we can hopefully all, all be proud of. And as we turn our vision into reality, we can hope that other countries will indeed look to Scotland to learn how to become a Good Food Nation too. I therefore invite Parliament to approve the general principles of the Good Food Nation Scotland Bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes the debate on Good Food Nation Scotland Bill, and it's now time to move on to the next item of business, which is approval of an SSI. And I ask Ben McPherson to speak to and move motion 3722 on approval of an SSI. President Officer, in response to the shocking and developing situation in Ukraine, the Scottish Government continues to take urgent steps to resettle people fleeing here. The Home Office has announced it has created new schemes for Ukrainian people to come to the UK to settle. One, the Ukraine Family Scheme, which allows those living in the UK with family in the Ukraine uh, to bring them to the UK to settle. And two, uh, the Homes for Ukraine Scheme, which allows individuals, charities, communi community groups and businesses in the UK to support a Ukrainian person to come here. Normally, many forms of social security assistance have eligibility restrictions for those subject to immigration control. However, individuals coming from Ukraine will not be subject to immigration control, which means they will not be affected by any such restrictions. Moreover, 
that immigration restrictions are, are not the only obstacle. Individuals arriving from the Ukraine, including those who already have a right of abode in the UK, would normally face. The Department for Work and Pensions laid emergency regulations yesterday, coming into force today, which seek to exempt these individuals uh, from two remaining obstacles to uh, immediate eligibility for Social Security assistance, those being the habitual residence test and the past presence test. Presiding officer, these tests appear in both UK and Scottish Social Security legislation. Application of these tests, uh, each of which require an individual to have spent a certain amount of time in the UK to establish their eligibility, would uh, be likely to stop individuals from uh, arriving from Ukraine from being able to claim support until they have been here for up to six months. The DWP regulations therefore seek to disapply these tests for people in specified groups arriving from Ukraine, uh, and if passed, they will enable these people to be able to access social security benefits from day one. And I commend UK ministers for their actions in this regard. Presiding officer, the regulations before this parliament propose to make mirroring modifications to devolve social security legislation. These amendments are being made to both UK benefits delivered under agency agreement in Scotland and regulations made under the Social Security Scotland Act 2018. In addition, we are making equivalent amendments to the, reg to the regulations for council tax reduction entitlement uh, in the same instrument. President Officer, I appreciate that the Parliament has not had its usual opportunity for full scrutiny of these regulations, and I am aware that this is far from ideal. However, the pace at which the legislation has to be developed in order to meet the necessary timescales meant that normal scrutiny was simply not possible in this case. I hope Parliament can empathise with this, given the situation and the circumstances. I am grateful to the Scottish Commission on Social Security for working with Scottish Government officials to help bring forward this urgent legislation in the shortest time possible. And uh, Scottish Government officials worked at pace with uh, UK Government officials as well, commendably. Scotland uh, is uh, a welcoming country and wants to be so for, for new arrivals coming for Ukra from Ukraine. Uh, and I hope colleagues will agree that this instrument is necessary in order uh, that we can ensure uh, that those arriving from Ukraine, uh, fleeing situations that we, we cannot even imagine, uh, are able to access crucial social security support on arrival in Scotland. And I move the, move the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item is approval of an SSI, and I ask Claire Hawhey to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. Thank you. Motion 3688, and the question on that motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of three Parliamentary Bureau motions, and I ask George Adam, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, to move motions 3736, 3737, 3738 and 3741 on approval of SSIs. Thank you, President Officer, and all moved. Thank you, and I call on Brian Whittle. And can I confirm, Mr Whittle, that you are speaking on motions 3736 to 3738? Uh, that's correct, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I rise to oppose uh, these motions on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. At the COVID Recovery Committee, my colleague Murdo Fraser and I had the opportunity to question the Deputy First Minister, John Swinney, on the reasons the Scottish Government were pushing forward uh, with their plans to extend emergency powers. I think it is fair to say, Presiding Officer, that we did not get any satisfactory answers. And the reality is that when asked, John Swinney could not give me any advantage that would have been gained had the Scottish Government had these powers at the start of the pandemic. And we have to remember at that time, when asked to do so, this Parliament acted quickly to scrutinise Scottish Government plans and pass that emergency legislation. And I would also suggest that with the hybrid technology now deployed, we are able to do that even quicker. So the question has to be why are the Scottish Government trying to bypass this Parliament? Uh, I will give way, yeah. John Mason. Well, would the member accept that one of the answers at committee was that the numbers in hospital at the moment with COVID are exceptionally high? And this is not a good time to be reducing the powers that the Government has. Brian Whittle. I think the, me the, the, the member was, uh, is obviously part of that, that committee as well, but if you remember with the, with the answers that gave there, was that the fact is that there are, there are a lot of people in hospital at the moment, but the, the actual severity of that is low, the deaths are low, 
And the, fact, the other fact is here, and, and I'll, go back to, I'll go back to the point, I go back to the point that this Parliament is able to, uh, is able to move uh, legislation extremely quickly, and, and the, the majority of the rules actually are not, are not in law, they are just guidance. I think, uh, given, given that we know, give, 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 let me make some progress here. given that we know that the public adhere quite strictly to public health guidance, it is our view that we should proceed to address COVID through public health guidance rather than through extended extraordinary and emergency powers by another six months, as the instrument seeks to do. Now, we do recognise that there are some, some aspects of the instruments that are beneficial, such as, the, such as the provision to allow nurses rather than doctors to administer vaccines. However, given that we cannot amend statutory instruments before us, we must either accept them as a whole or reject them as a whole. Given the extent of the emergency powers that the Scottish Government seek to extend, we must reject them as a whole. After all, Presiding Officer, all we are asking is that Parliament has the opportunity to scrutinise legislation before it comes into being, as is Parliament's responsibility. As we have come to expect, though, the Scottish Government are not comfortable with scrutiny, but on this occasion we need to. There is no need, there is no need for the, ex the extension as requested, and I would ask Parliament to reject these motions. Thank you. Thank you. I call on John Swinney. Very officer, um, on the question of scrutiny, uh, I regularly appear in front of the yes. COVID Recovery Committee to explain the, the necessary measures the government has having to take in these extraordinary circumstances. And I will happily appear in front of the committee on any occasion that the committee wishes to see me to scrutinise and to answer the points the committee wishes to put to me. Uh, I faithfully answer the questions that Mr Whittle and his colleagues put to me in committee. I cannot be responsible for the fact that Mr Whittle does not like the answers that I share with him, but I faithfully attend that committee to give the answers on behalf of the government. Of course, I could wait. Brian Whittle. Well, in that case, Mr Swinney, will you answer me the question that I asked you in the COVID Recovery Committee? What, how, how, would you have benefit, how would we have benefited for those powers to have been in place prior to the pandemic? Because at that time, you did not answer me. John Swinney. Uh, the, well, the, this, this is a pretty fundamental issue because, and it will affect the COVID recovery and reform bill that Parliament is going to fully scrutinise in the normal parliamentary process. Because what this relates to is whether or not we have a statute book that is capable of addressing the emergency circumstances that we have faced. Now, the United Kingdom Parliament has legislated in the past for England and Wales to have statutory powers. Uh, to innate, well, Mr Whittle mutters from the sidelines, it's not the same. It is exactly the same. Because what the United Kingdom Parliament has legislated for is for there to be powers that can be exercised by ministers where there is essentially the emergency of a pandemic. We do not have those powers in Scotland. We had to legislate for them in a great degree of a hurry at the start of the pandemic. And what the government is asking to do here is with Parliament having considered this legislation, is to extend this for a further, some limited provisions for a six-month period, and Parliament can consider the full legislation. Now, there are four um, regulations, sets of regulations in front of Parliament today. I won't rehearse all of the details about them, but unless they are passed today, there will not be the ability, for example, for local authorities to be able to take the type of wide public health interventions that local authorities have taken to deal with the pandemic at local level, because those are inherent in the health protection coronavirus restrictions directions by local authority regulations. And also, if we do not put these, uh, extend the deadlines for these regulations tonight, the ability of us to maintain, for example, the face coverings arrangements that we have in place, which, given the point that Mr Mason has just made about hospital cases, over 2,000 people in hospital with COVID, a larger number. We've never had as many people in hospital before in the pandemic with COVID. So there, there, there is a gravity of the situation that we need to, to continue to address. Now, of course, there are measures that the government is removing as a consequence of these regulations uh, tonight. That is consistent with what we say in the strategic framework, that we will not retain any of these powers or responsibilities a moment longer than necessary. So I would invite Parliament 
to support the statutory instruments that are in front of Parliament tonight. They are essential to make sure we have the public health protections in place to deal with a continuing severe situation from COVID. And it is the duty of Parliament to ensure that we have the legislative framework properly considered that can address that very situation. Thank you. The question on these motions will be put at decision time. There are seven questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that motion 3704, in the name of Mary Goujon, on stage one debate at Good Food Nation Scotland Bill, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 3722, in the name of Ben McPherson, on approval of an SSI, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 3688, in the name of Claire Hawhey, on approval of an SSI, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next question is that motion 3736, in the name of George Adam, on approval of an SSI, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will have a short technical suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.